So welcome back. This is Andy and this is the Poor Pearls Almanac. And I'm Elliot and I'm actually really proud of you, buddy. You did it. Good intro. I'm all grown up now. You can't find us on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, you kind of ruined it, bud. I said can't, didn't I? Yep. Nice. So what's on the docket today, bud? Yeah, so today we're going to be talking about the Dayak. There's a really long, unique history of forest management that I think will be, well, really interesting to dive into. That said, I want to preface this entire conversation with an important point, and that's the term Dayak itself refers to over 200 different tribes that are scattered across an incredibly wide geography on the island of Borneo. These tribes have a super wide spectrum of dialects and land management practices that are based on the varied terrain of the island, which, by the way, is the third largest in the world. For context, it's like roughly the size of Texas and hosts some of the oldest rainforests in the world. It's also considered by researchers to be part of Zomia. Okay, so Zomia sounds fictitious because I've never heard of Zomia, so it's not really a country. It's more like, you know, a region, I guess. So... It is pretty much fake. I knew it. So the history of Zomia really starts around 1997 when an anthropologist, Jean Michaud, tries to figure out an easy way or an encapsulating way to categorize the diverse Southeast Asian population and region with hundreds, if not thousands of different languages, dozens of different religions, an extensive range of social structures and customs. Southeast Asia is not just unique, but it's really consistent in that uniqueness, which is where Zomia is essentially born, originally called Zomi. Okay, so Zomi went from Zomi to Zomia. Is there a difference or is it just... Well, yeah, so I'll elaborate a little bit. Despite the overwhelming diversity, a dividing line can be really discerned between the folks living in like the highlands and those living in low-lying flat areas. By looking at the various diverse human societies that had populated the lands above around a thousand feet sea level in southeastern parts of the Asian landmass, Michaud found shared commonalities across a huge geographical region that extends beyond the conventional mainland Southeast Asian countries. So like Malaysia, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. And this also includes parts of like Myanmar and China and Bangladesh and India and even Taiwan. These commonalities include a sense of marginalization, a lack of state subordination, and a really vast ecosystem. Okay, so it sounds like they took a region where people sort of found the secret to, I guess, living sustainably and effectively within their ecology by sort of carving out niches that they can live within with land management and foresight based on historical or ancestral knowledge? Yeah, so that's pretty accurate to how you might describe this group. And it was really around 2002, Willem van Schendel proposes this term, Zomia, as opposed to Zomi. And Zomi is a common word in many of the tibeto burman languages for the Highlander. You can make a Highlander joke if you want. <laughs> uh, and the terms used in several countries which form part of this Southeast Asian massif. So Zomia really captures both the diversity of this vast region overlapping multiple countries. And it's a key characteristic in specifically these higher altitude peoples. Yeah, the more you know. And we all know the, Highla we all know the Highlander rules. Exactly. Don't mind me. I just go down these rabbit holes. And to paraphrase Ron Swanson, I don't go down a lot of rabbit holes. I go down all the rabbit holes. Yeah, I guess you sort of kind of remind me of a Ron Swanson, but smaller stature and personality and wit. Yeah, it's mostly the, the flannel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably it. So today we're going to be discussing some of the indigenous management practices of what we described, the hilly upland parts of the island of Borneo. And again, if the description of both the Dayak and Zumia didn't make it clear, we'll be painting with fairly broad strokes. One of the things we've talked quite a bit about on this podcast is pointing out that traditional ecological knowledge, it's usually a response to the ecological conditions of a location. And much of what we understand about the Dayak culture and agriculture is mostly based on how it exists today, as there really isn't a whole lot of documentation about the practices, although we do know they've existed for thousands of years. Yeah, so people are still practicing the things that we're going to talk about, 
but maybe with a new school twist on how they do it, or maybe some new introduced technology that might still be traditional practice, but it's so-called ancestral knowledge that we talk about. Exactly. So kind of like what we had talked with like Ireland as the population shrank and they brought new technologies into more traditional practices. Now, the Dayak have historically and currently practiced things like shifting agriculture or shifting cultivation or hill rice farming, which is paired with long fallow periods. So you get this intensive agroforestry, which follows it, and a natural resource extraction. Shifting cultivation is a really complex agricultural system that's dedicated to non-permanent shifting field use that's traditionally associated with using like fire for clearing land. The term most often heard is Sweden or shifting cultivation, which is really predominant in tropical regions. Okay, so tropical regions with intensive land management needed. I, I feel like I, people know why, but I'm just going to go ahead and guess. I know in tropical regions, there tends to be issues with soil quality or the amount of time it takes to reintroduce nutrients into the soil. Yeah, so tropical soils generally trap all their biomass in the living materials and have just in general kind of shitty soils, which seems counterintuitive to the diversity of the rainforest and the thing that we think of it as like this super healthy, complex place. And this has to do a bit with the mineral makeup of the soils, the temperature, the rainfall, the humidity, and a bunch of stuff. The short of it is that the soils just really aren't good for traditional or at least as we think of today, traditional agriculture. So things like burning is a really good way to get nutrients quickly back into the soil. Okay, so they didn't have time for leaf litter to build up biomass to get those nutrients stored. So they went the fire beaver route and sort of set everything on fire to do what they needed to do. Hell yeah, fire beaver that shit. Bring on those fire beavers. So Sweden or shifting cultivation involves temporary cultivation of plots of land, which are then abandoned and allowed to revert to their natural vegetation while the cultivator moves on to another plot. The system can be maintained in the long term if it's able to adapt to and integrate with local conditions and generally as long as there's other supplemental systems in place as well. Most shifting cultivation systems blend agriculture with hunting, fishing, and gathering, as well as resource use systems in essentially a multi-niche strategy. Typically, shifting cultivators incorporates perennial crops such as fruits, nuts, medicines, and even resin trees. Mmm, resin trees. Can't forget those. Yeah, like rubber trees. Yeah, R yeah. Everybody loves a good rubber tree, Andy. Yeah, sometimes they do. You tell yourself that. Bring on the rubbers. <laughs> <laughs> Elliot is dying right now and you can't see it. Sorry. So traditionally speaking, uh, a, woody, a, a wooded area of roughly an acre or so is selected for cultivation and the trees and shrubs are cut and the smaller material is burned initially to improve the soil fertility. A so-called ladang or a swidden field is planted with rice for one to five years at most and rice is often intercropped with other annuals. When sufficient time has passed to restore fertility and reduce the weed population and agricultural pests, the field will be cleared and then reused for cultivation. It's believed that this practice has been in place for at least around 6,000 years there. Yeah, so that sounds pretty sustainable, I guess. It's uh, a little more complicated than just throwing some rice in cassava or whatever into a recently burned field. And it's a series of practices that you're like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Why didn't I think of that? I guess that happens if you got 6,000 years to kind of figure things out though, right? Yeah, I would hope so. But before that, the Dayak people employed certain criteria before taking something from nature. So first, part of this process is that they have to notify the customary head who has managed that land previously of the purpose, which is interesting because while somebody may have managed it, they don't necessarily own or have the rights to decide what to do with it or that somebody can't use it. Second, a number of people are assigned to looking through this piece of land to find the specific forest plot that they want to use. And during this process, they'll spend some time in the forest to essentially receive instructions or obtain signs from nature while also providing some kind of offering. In addition, the targeted forest area and their soils are really checked carefully to establish whether or not it makes a lot of sense and if it's a suitable site for growing rice. 
23rd, when the appropriate plot has been confirmed, an opening ceremony of the forest will be performed and a sign of recognition that the forest is giving life to them is gone through and they ask for a blessing and protection of the forest, not just the site they're working on, but the entire forest. Okay, so just to paraphrase that, there's a proper introduction to the chosen spot, and then they listen and pay attention to input needs and possible outputs, and then eventually, after everybody has gotten to know each other, they sort of have a birthday party and then plan shit for 6,000 years? Yeah. I think I nailed it. I should get a job at writing blurbs. I think I need a side hustle. Kind of. Yeah, we'll go with that. (laughs) It's a very American way to look at it. So the farming season begins in August or September at the end of the dry season with cultivation season of about six months. Before they even begin to farm, they mark the boundary of the plot intended for shifting cultivation by cutting the trees. To prepare the site for rice cultivation, they clear cut the undergrowth so it can dry out before burning. The farmers then burn the grass and the weeds on their existing plots or open new plots from the forested areas. If a new plot is opened, as we had discussed, They also remove trees that are larger than six inches in diameter to use as fuel wood for cooking. So some material is taken out. It's not all just burned or chopped down there. And this activity is typically done with the owner and their families together or even with their neighbors. From there, the ground is essentially hand tilled to remove remaining roots and to loosen the soil. The rice is hand planted at the end of September usually within a week after the other practices are done before the weeds have started to come in. This rice is planted by a process called dibbling. I know you think everybody knows this stuff, but what exactly is dibbling? Because that sounds fake as well, but I'm just going to go ahead and give it a shot before you give me the answer because it sounds kind of fun. Um, it sounds like they take like a reed or a shoot of some sort and they put the rice seeds in there and then there's like a plunger, like st- stick uh that you push down and it kind of pops the seeds into the ground at like the right depth like if you have like a skilled hand you can kind of like pop them and like go in like a row like real fast and just sort of dibble those seeds down how am i doing how's that sound it's not too far off so the dibbling process is a traditional method of planting rice in humid tropical climates like what we're talking about one of the biggest challenges around planting rice is due to the salinity of the topsoil from rains While rice can grow if it's just broadcast over a field, dibbling is the process of planting the rice about an inch down into the soil to reduce its contact with the saline crust that's so commonly associated with these poorer soils, as we had pointed out earlier. So during the dry season, which if we think about when we're burning at the end of the dry season, all the salts that have sat on the soil and have slowly baked into that crust can really reduce the success of the seeds that you might plant right on the surface. That sounds like a lot of work, and I'm actually surprised because in a weird roundabout way, I was actually kind of right. Yeah, in a very Elliot fashion, you were technically right. Yeah, I just impressed myself. (laughs) This process, because it is a lot of work, is usually done with neighbors who work together, and they try to arrange their schedule so that pretty much all the neighbors can participate in dibbling activities. And those same neighbors also are involved in harvesting the rice at the beginning and the end of the dry season. So what ends up happening is there's a long period of successional burns, successional planting, where everyone's working together, doing the same things and helping. And I would imagine that certain people are better or worse at certain parts of these processes. And they ultimately kind of draw their their passions or their interests to doing the thing, whether it's burning or dibbling or whatever. And that's that's what they primarily do as people are doing those successions. Now, one of the other downsides of this dibbling process where you're putting the seed under that topsoil is that you tend to get heavier competition from weeds. So the plots are weeded continually throughout the entire year. But what's great about this system is that if you're going to have to go in there and remove weeds, it makes a lot of sense to start planting some intercrops as well, right? They intercrop uh, cassava, bananas, chili peppers, a spinach-like vegetable called sagao, lemongrass and sweet potato and other perennial crops that are planted when the rice is about knee height. So in about 6,000 years, they figured out the right way to sort of companion plants together and plant them so that they helped each other out. But also, we all know that nature abhors a vacuum. So in those spaces where the weeds are growing, they found a way to companion plant and sort of get plants to grow together and pair well, play along, play nice together in the little lovely garden. Yeah, it's kind of got big uh, three sisters energy, right? 
So this planting method is called manugal. When starting a field, they would plant different varieties of rice, and in every family, there's essentially this super top secret superior rice variety called upun bunyi. People had a belief that they couldn't share this name with anyone except family members because it would bring bad luck for their yields. So each family had their own like ancestral like grain, like species of rice. Yeah, everyone has their cultivar that they've selectively bred for a number of years, and it's it's this really interesting way to pair our understanding of our relationship with the ecology, our relationship with food, and also our ancestry. Where especially this particular rice is really your family's history in a lot of ways, which is just like this really cool sentimental understanding of our transience in terms of like the generations that'll exist and what we leave behind to our descendants. Yeah, that's pretty cool. It reminds me of the conversation we had about Monument and the wild rice and was it Minnesota? Yep. Yeah, that was a fun episode and that totally has like the same vibe to it. I like that. Yeah. So just generally speaking in this practice, there are at least five different varieties of rice that are being used. And that's dependent on the size of the plot of land that had been cleared for this practice. Additionally, people use traditional methods to eradicate pests in their fields. Things like flowers, for example. If a bird came to the field to eat the rice, it would actually get fooled by seeing these yellow flowers that are planted within the rice, which look like rice, and would start eating the flowers instead of the rice. Yeah, so this is a little bit different from what we've talked about before, where it's not the traditional terrace rice patties that you think about when that, I'm not going to say you think about that, I think about when you talk about rice patties and, you know, they're flooded with water and the little rice shoots stick up. This seems more like there's like, you know, seven other plants planted together. And it sort of reminds me of like a wild looking garden with natural deterrence that blend in with the companion plants and everything's growing all together. It's not just one monocrop of a rice patty. It's more like, you know, I guess that word food forest. Yeah. So I think like in a lot of permaculture, you hear this idea of like interspecies planting and they'll say you have to plant this because it has this benefit and you plant this because it has this benefit and it's taking this idea, but instead of thinking about the relationships these plants have with each other and ourselves, like we had just talked about with this rice, the flowers, the rices, the roots that we're talking about have been together, you know, ancestrally for hundreds of years, if not thousands. And instead, we're trying to take parts of these things because one is a good root crop and you can stick that with tomatoes because we like tomatoes instead of whatever. We try to plug and play all these different parts without recognizing that the reason they're successful is their relationship that they've evolved with together, their ancestry, their history together. And a lot of permaculture doesn't incorporate that into that process. It's more about these are the plants traditionally used by a bunch of different people, but these are the foods we like to eat, so we're just going to smash them together. And that's where I think a lot of stuff gets lost. And to circle back to what we talked about a few episodes back when we were doing Korean natural farming, on top of this diversity, they also utilize the plants that they are growing to make things that can help protect the plants. So like they grow tobacco, and they'll do a tobacco water or a garlic water which they'll spray their plants with, which will deter a lot of brown plant hoppers, which are a major pest for rice. And, you know, we talked about like these layering and these different plants. If, say, mice went in to go eat the rice, they would actually probably eat like the sweet potatoes first, which aren't, to them at least, as valuable as that rice. Yeah, so they had like a sacrifice crop or like a defensive crop or like protector crops. That's pretty cool. Exactly. They make a sacrifice to the the mice gods. Hey folks, thanks for listening. This is Andy from the Poor Proles Almanac. Hopefully you're enjoying the podcast so far, and right now I'm talking to you from a commercial in a Poor Proles Almanac podcast. I'm sure you're enjoying the show and maybe even enjoying some of our ridiculous ads. We are able to keep our episodes ad-free and keep the lights on here because of support from listeners like you. If you think we're adding valuable perspective to the subjects of agriculture, ecology, climate change, and politics, then please consider giving us some support on Venmo, Ko-Fi, Patreon, or PayPal, all of which can be found at our website, poorproles.com. Please, don't make me go to Jeff for money. Jeffrey, Jeffrey But 
Seriously, though, fuck mice. Okay, strong feelings about permaculture and mice. You've never had to deal with mice eating your chicken feed. Nope. I, I mean, I guess. Or nesting in your hay. Also, you, you got me there, I guess. Or in your coop. All right, got it. Just saying, trust me on this one. Fuck the squeaky boys. Are you saying sacrifice the mice to bigger, better predator gods? It's the American way, right? Anyways, there's a sequence for planting the types of rice. They'd plant those less desirable crops around the edges, and as they got closer to the center of the field, the best rice varieties, so like their family rice, would be in the center and most protected from this type of browsing. Okay, so even with all these crops, they didn't plant all of this every year. Like, they, they were getting multiple years to harvest from all of this, and the center of the little garden was where all the goodness is, where the soul lives. Yeah, they would get around three years or so, but it was and is still possible to harvest for up to five years. And just because the field goes fallow doesn't mean it's not of value anymore, nor does allowing it to rewild mean that it's just going to go without value in the future. In those fallow rice fields, things like intensive agroforests are often maintained to supply things like needed wood and even other food products. In many scenarios, hill rice fallows are converted to agroforest permanently, or at least longer than the living memory of the people that manage it exists. Okay, so after they're done harvesting the food from it, they reutilize the site based on its new conditions with, you know, different nutrient content. There still might be able to be stuff that grows there. You just n might not be able to eat it. Yeah, so it changes. By that, let's say, fifth year, the last year that you could possibly grow the rice, it's this time called bola cuacao. The soil is essentially not fertile for rice, but it's still got some fertility and you've added biomass. So for succession will be allowed to take place in that area. And during this time, by the fifth year, some of those perennials, the trees and things like that, have started to work their way in those early succession species. The first following stage after this goes by a few different names. We'll go with the one that's easiest to pronounce, Urat. And this forest succession starts after the rice harvest in March. So at this time, arable land is already covered by some plant species and like I said, there's a couple trees in particular that are of value, starting with the Macarenga genus, which, sorry, there's no common name for these guys, as well as Trema orientalis, but they stay below about three or so feet at this point. Trema orientalis, that sounds familiar. That's, th that's in the Cannabaceae family, I'm pretty sure. It is, actually. It's used as a medicinal plant, which I know, surprising. The young leaves can be harvested like a spinach and beneficially. A lot of the Cannabaceae family is nitrogen fixing. So the others that are primarily grown as early succession species are primarily used for things like charcoal and timber. Yep, can is good for the land too. This one at least. And this brief succession phase is only about five months. So it's during that dry season between the March harvest and about August, after which all the vegetation is cut down again. When I say vegetation, I mean all of the stuff that's growing underneath. Following the stage is Arat Mangur, which is the forest succession between about two and four years after the rice has gone fallow. During this stage, the trees get bigger, up to about 15 feet within that few years. This is followed by Arat Palega, which is from years three and five or so, and you can see that there's this kind of overlap of time, and that's based on like climate and soil quality and so on. But essentially, over the next few years, these trees get to about 30 feet and start to bear fruit within about five years. Yeah, they bear weed fruit, and that's pretty cool. So they do bear fruit, but it's not really human fruit. It's mostly for like birds, specifically the green pigeon, and the leaves and the seeds are also fed to livestock. When these fields are no longer used for the rice cultivation and start this process of reforestation, they fall under this really broad umbrella term of erotin. And Arotin is a necessary piece of this transition, and it provides a lot of needed resources for the communities, primarily being wood construction for field houses and firewood. Generally, the larger wood is used in construction, while the smaller wood is used for firewood. Additionally, there are some understory growths like edible species of bamboo and rattan shoots, which are often found in this stage along with those trees and new coming fruit trees that will take over later on. At this point, the need for wood is so important because they have these field houses near where they're working, and generally these need to be repaired like annually or just rebuilt completely if a family's opened up a new field. 
Yeah, so they pretty much have a new managed field of diverse crops again after they've taken the nutrients and grown their food. They come in and grow the other resources that they'll need for, you know, their coppicing and pollarding trees, whether it's firewood or material to build new homes and huts and things. Yeah, so they pretty much have spent millennia watching the natural processes in these forests and they slightly impact them in order to get the best materials for humans out of the forest. That sounds like a great use of time. I don't know what I'm doing with my life. If it's not obvious yet, the Dayaks spend most of their time managing these various sites, hence the field houses, and they're always managing a rice paddy somewhere because it is a, a, an integral part of their diet. So even once one field goes fallow, that means the next year they're burning and doing all of that stuff while also managing these other sites. So what that means is there's like this spoken wheel system always going around where they have these annual processes and they're always working on the different stages at any given moment. But to be able to do all this, they need to have these field houses. Now, every family who has an umak or one of these fields also has a field house. So wood is removed on essentially a regular basis from these uratans. We had mentioned that there was bamboo, which is often used for things like building pens for livestock. Uh, which is a more modern thing that they've they've never traditionally had. It's also used for things like floors and field houses and altars for ceremonial purposes. Edible rattan shoots are also another very useful food source that is harvested from this space. Okay, so we've seen this before in another previous episode. When we went to Norway, they had like sort of seasonal housing, depending on what part of the cycle they're in and where they're working. Yeah. So they had like a house close to the field. And then they had a house close to, I guess, home, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, they actually had multiple vacation homes or farm homes, seasonal homes. Let's call them seasonal homes based on the time of year because they were grazing animals on such a wide scope. So once again, we see farmers that can afford a vacation house. Well, I don't have one. It's a farm hut. I want a farm hut. Okay, so just spitballing. You can go use that playpen that you hide the feed from the sheep in. You can totally curl up and like lay down there and catch a siesta or whatever. So my my child's two feet by two feet by like three feet high kid's house. I mean, I know I'm short, but I'm not that short. So I'm not sure if that's going to work. I got to get one of those uh, tiny houses on wheels and just rotate it in my backyard. Listen, you're in America. You got to earn your vacation house. You got to earn those 12 hours a year. You get a vacation time. That's right. You got to grind. Thanks for reminding me. Get to work. <laughs> so anyways, as these uh, younger trees start to mature and begin to get cleared for use like firewood, the understory, those fruit trees that we had mentioned before, as well as some others, start shooting up and taking over. And this stage is called Kalawako. And this is around six or so years in. The early succession remaining macarangas that haven't been cut down, as well as Elliot's nitrogen-fixing weed tree, and also the burr flower tree, which we don't know a whole lot about and a variety of what's called Shoria genus trees are also taking over, which are great for producing more resins and what's called Borneo tallow nuts. It's not my tree. I left my trees in the truck today. (laughs) All right, fine. Not your tree. Maybe like your cousin's tree. Or maybe it's your family ancestral tree. That sounds cool. Think about it. Imagine having your own weed yeah i I literally i literally just thought about it i did and that sounds cool (laughs) and now you're gonna have to start learning about weed genetics and like grow the family heritage weed strain easy peasy yeah definitely something you'll need in the apocalypse the uh elliot brand everyone wants to know the secret about but nobody but the family gets i mean in the society the dystopic future that i've imagined i mean weed is the currency hash coins even if you don't like it somebody else will and i feel like it's just something that you can always trade like i know it was a joke in trailer park boys but like seriously hash coins it makes a lot of sense yeah <laughs> like quite literally uh <laughs> just saying you know ricky has some some great moments at this point the forest quickly continues to have those new species move in that understory And those trees that we just mentioned, the early stage succession, kind of hit their maximum size and start naturally dying off, in some cases having climbed up to like 100 feet in as little as like nine years. That's pretty crazy. So this is the area that the nutrients have sort of been used up to grow food, but they're still pulling enough nutrients out to grow 100 feet in nine years. That's mind-blowing to me. 
Yeah, these trees don't fuck around. They do work. They they work. This period is called Batang. Sorry, I, that's the hardest word I'm going to say today. Pelega. The following stage is called Hemarmangur, and it takes place over 20 years. And I promise we're getting to the end of the point where I start pronouncing all these words terribly. Now, the name Hima uh, refers to primary forest, which is an indication that some of the species from the existing primary forest have started to return. And those longer growing fruit tree species that we traditionally think of for this region start taking over. Things like the infamous Dorian tree, as well as others that we don't have the records to really identify or they just have their Latin names, but provide a bunch of diversity in terms of fruit content. Even in major research papers, these trees don't have much documentation. And even if you do a Google search, you might get a couple vague sentences that just say, this is a fruit tree that exists in this region that people eat. And that's all you're going to get. Yeah, so we're getting pretty deep into the weeds. We've talked about weed and a lot of species and stuff. But how does this all wrap up into the overall picture of the Dayak? Yeah, so my goal really isn't to bore people with the statistical facts and naming a bunch of fruit trees that they're going to forget like later tonight. The idea is to showcase how the Dayak have really taken advantage of each of these species for specific utilities and how that relates to the native ecology. So far, we've seen the concept of annual agricultural production, wood production, greens, herbs, nuts, and fruits, and resins. And now we're seeing this natural cycle slowly start to take over. In the next successions called Hema with a bunch of different terms after it, these successions host forests with an age up to 500 years. At this point, the forest is no longer managed by humans and is primarily for hunting and collecting fruits and things like that. The shifting cultivation stages and forest succession periods can, in combination, amount to decades, if not centuries. Yeah, so I feel like we touched on this uh, a bit before, but this highlights the difference between what permaculture talks about as food forest, sort of what it really looks like in, in practice, for real. It's not just, you know, a jumble of plants where you can walk through and just harvest all this abundance. It's thoroughly thought out and tried and tested. And I guess you could say they've done it with trial by fire, but they've also had the foresight and the practice of living within that landscape and knowing what works best with what. That's why we've talked about all the pairing of companion planting and things like that. They know what'll work in that situation and what won't. And I just feel like they've done really well kind of mimicking that system that nature tries to set up. Yeah. And what we're seeing is people identifying the best species. And honestly, there probably is a lot of natural selection, which we haven't even talked about, to utilize the trees that they thought could eventually become more important as a food source or a material source or whatever it might be. By identifying these species that grow naturally in their area and just essentially nudging them, helping them become the staples of the forest. As opposed to, again, like what we were talking about, this idea of importing species that aren't native or don't necessarily help improve the diversity in feeding the local ecology and in turn helping the resilience for that local ecology. Yeah, that reminds me of every damn arboretum I've ever gone to trying to learn more about plants and stuff and then finding out it's all fake. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, why, why is everything from the rest of the world and Why are there no bugs around these flowers, really? Because they should be, because they're supposed to be pollinating. Well, those bugs don't live there, and the ones that live there can't use what's in that plant or can't get into that flower, don't recognize it, or whatever it might be. So there's a lot to it. And in terms of the indigenous folks we're talking about, when it comes to this relationship with the plants, there's some really beautiful descriptions I read in some of the interviews with some of the researchers that had met with these people to discuss what they were doing. So I want to talk a little bit about their management practice in terms of how they do things. And that's really around their calendar for the forest management. And that's really driven by things like the rains and the winds and the calls of the birds. So like January to April is when they're primarily harvesting fruit and they repair their tools. And they do this until about the end of the rainy season. By about May, the boundaries start to get cut for the new plots. And in June, the first trees of the season are started to be felled, and this allows that ground to dry up enough so that when they fell these trees, it doesn't compact the soil like as if it had been sopping wet. Now in July and August, as the wind starts to kick up, uh, this is when they have the burning season. And again, if we recall, within about a week or so from that is when they start seeding, and they're doing this spoken wheel succession of burning a plot 
and then seeding it. But the next day they might be burning another plot. The next day they'll be burning another plot, which means a week later their seeding day keeps getting pushed back a day. And they have this nice cycle that goes through this time period. Now, by September or so, there's specific bird calls that signal that it's time to plant rice. For example, there's this bird called the Len Talking Bird, and that's probably being pronounced wrong. Uh, but it makes this really unique sound, which essentially sounds like throwing up. And it's this that signals that it's the end of the rice planting time, and it's time to start weeding. So it sounds like the, the bird call, it sounds like it's throwing up. It's not actually throwing up? Yes. So it's just like, oh, it's vomit o'clock. Time to stop. I, I just had a strange question pop into my head. Like, is bird puke, is that still guano? Or is there a different word because it's a different hole coming out of a different end? <laughs> Listen, everyone knows every hole gets its own word. <laughs> oh, it's so gross. Let's go to a commercial. <laughs> Hey there, it's Andy from the Poor Proles Almanac, and... And we're not the Poor Proles Almanac. You're right. We are tomorrow, today. And I'm Nash Flynn from Death and Friends. Tomorrow, today is our chance to talk to folks about cutting-edge research that helps us understand what tomorrow looks like, but today. We've got exciting guests. And we'll speculate wildly about what the future looks like. Will the ocean currents slow down in your lifetime, leaving temperate climates decimated? Will we go to Mars? Will we drown in climate-induced ocean floods filled with microplastics? Will new research rewrite the history our children read? Will the sun... Is this going to be another Doomer question? No. Tomorrow, today, wherever you get your podcasts, and also on Instagram. Well, at the least, it's better than the uh, cat puke I usually wake up to. I'm going to have to agree with you. I've stepped on hairballs in the morning and I I fucking hate it. <laughs> yeah. For their sake, I hope it is at least. Okay. So getting back to the Dyak, these succession periods that we've talked about, do they all come at the same time during the year or is it all based on like the signals? Like the bird calls can come sometimes two weeks early or the rains sometimes start a month early. Like how, how does all that work? So the idea is that instead of utilizing a calendar, they're really thinking about nature telling them that it's the time of the year to plant these things. So we like, we think about a calendar and it's like, oh, it's May 2nd. Like that's the last day for the frost. And it, you look at the seven day forecast and you see that there's no frost coming for seven days. So you're like, all right, well, if it doesn't come this week, it's pretty unlikely that it's going to come after. Instead, they would utilize, well, what species are we seeing that know better than us to know that we're not going to get any frost? So that's the logic to it. In a way, it's kind of interesting because even with climate change, they're still going to look for the same signals. It might be three weeks later, it might be whatever, but it doesn't really matter too much. But in terms of the actual forest succession process, there is a same general, let's call it, structure for how these forests are developed. But certain areas, depending on a number of different things like soil type and water content and so on, can be more geared towards things like fruits or resins. And again, we talked about that there's multiple plots and these communities exist communally. So you might want to take advantage of a site having mostly fruits. And there's this term called simpuging, uh, which is considered to be primarily a fruit garden consisting of jackfruits, slangset, durian, coconut, lye, and sunkai, as well as others. There's also these plots called kibotin, which are plots that are primarily geared around rattan and rubber. Now, remember we're talking about plots of land, like I said, that are only a few acres in size. So you might have a cluster of people that are just managing fruit plots and a cluster of people that are managing the rattan and rubber sites. And because the Dayak live very communally, there's an understanding of sharing of land and resources. And this allows for a better sense of reciprocity between the individuals in the community. Yeah, so that's the interesting part of this when we, um, you were doing the research and we were talking about this that I found was interesting. The way they live communally sort of allows them to focus on their interest and what they're good at. And they sort of self-assign roles based on, you know, who's best at, at what. And it just, every, everything just sort of falls into place naturally. I don't think they spend a lot of time assigning jobs and work and things like that. I'm sure they go over and, and explain what takes priority. But as far as how the work gets done, I feel like it's done pretty seamlessly. Yeah. And that's like I'd mentioned, your decisions aren't defined by what you inherit in terms of like your parents working this piece of land and it was a rubber site. You're going to cut it down and plant your rice. And then in five years, you're going to be working towards that. 
you can choose to go to somebody else and say, I want to work on this piece of land that, you know, hosts fruit forest or whatever it might be, because that's what I'm interested in. I enjoy working with those trees because everyone understands that there's no value in having the, the high value crop or whatever it might be. It's, it's based on your interests and that can drive where you end up working, which is just like a really nice, thoughtful way of saying you can do what you want because at the end of the day, we're all going to benefit from it. So why not let you do the thing you're more passionate about, uh, which is just a really nice, nice understanding of our relationship with each other and the world. So let's talk about today. And so all of this is still going on today, right? I know sometimes we talk about things that happened 6,000 years ago, but this has been going on for 6,000 years to current, right? Well, yes and no. I got it. Just answer the question, Andy. So yes, they still exist, but it's been kind of a bumpy ride to say the least. The term Dayak has been co-opted in the last couple decades to be a generic term for the indigenous people of Borneo which distinguishes them from the primarily coastal metropolitan folks of many of these countries. Now, while similarities exist between the indigenous people of these places, as we had discussed at the beginning of the episode, the ecology drives a lot of the differences and it's a bit more nuanced. Okay, so it's different from here because we would never do that in this country. No, America doesn't see color. That's why I treat you like you're white. Yeah, it's pretty. <laughs> so that's pretty consistent across the Dayak too? So yeah, when uh, we're talking about the Dayak, specifically the way we have been using it, not the way it may traditionally be used today, this social organization has been really historically based around this subsistence Sweden agriculture. And this is reinforced through um, what they call longhouse communities. The longhouse communities and the subsistence Sweden agriculture is the consistent part. That's the commonality that ties these different peoples together across the Dayak. Yeah. And like we said, these communities have traditionally done this hill rice farming as opposed to wet rice paddy cultivation, which Elliot had referred to earlier, which is thought to be, at least from an outsider's perspective, the most common throughout Southeast Asia. Yeah, those monocrop rice paddy puddles. Yeah. So this brings us back to Zumiya. The original political and social structure for the Dayak was based on this longhouse. Historically, this method of housing provides protection against warring ethnic groups, although I'm really suspicious of that claim. The Longhouse is the traditional Dayak communal home, where several families live in one large housing unit, and they essentially share a common roof and wall. Many traditional Longhouses have housed even like 200 or more families, and were hundreds of feet long. The houses are elevated off the ground and are built with a large communal veranda with individual and multiple family homes sharing those common walls. There are often multiple families that will live within one unit within the longhouse. If, say, an additional home is needed because of new families moving in or children growing up and having their own children, they'll build on the end of the longhouse in multiple directions. So these longhouses can end up existing and extending into multiple directions and develop really into like a maze. And this allows them to accommodate any growing community. Yeah, this reminds me of this one time I watched my nephew played Minecraft and he was building a house and it just went on for forever. And that's pretty much that that I you explaining that brought that to mind so I could visually see it. They're just at the add on you have a new baby or somebody starts a new family. Just add them on to the end of the longhouse. Yeah. Grandma wants to move in. Just add on like a little closet to the end of the longhouse. <laughs> like that's how it works. <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot of multi-generational living and related families. You know, it's interesting because it forces people to have to live with and understand people even if they don't agree with them on everything. Now, unfortunately, this lifestyle has continued to be challenged specifically where we're focusing on, which is in Indonesia. Now, being Americans, most of us know Indonesia as like this coastal Asian country, but like that's probably as much as most people could say about it. Yeah, I know it's sort of like the land of a, a billion lakes because there's uh, not lakes, islands. It, aren't there like 15,000 some odd islands in Indonesia? I don't know if they all have names, but I'm sure they're there, right? Yeah. And like, if you think about it, lakes are kind of inverse islands, right? It's like an, a belly button, like an Audi versus an any, any right? <laughs> yeah, that's what an island is. Islands and lakes are <laughs> reciprocals of each other. Yes, Andy. Yes. Together, they make flat. 
So uh, that's how they got the. That's how you get to flat Earth. It's genius. <laughs> it all comes together. Uh, so yeah, that figure is uh, right around there, and I think about six thousand of them are inhabited. Across these six thousand islands, there's over three hundred distinct ethnic groups and at least three hundred and sixty-five recognized local languages living just in that country alone. I think it's cute that we call ourselves a melting pot because that just put us to shame. Yeah. We're like a boring fondue with like four cheeses, and this is an actual, that's what an actual melting pot looks like. Oh, we're like a smelly old cheese fondue. Yep. Like you're like, how long has that thing been on? And everyone's like, well, just don't turn it off because if it cools down, we're in trouble. The collective bacterial load, it will kill us all. Let's have a fondue party. Yeah. So uh, not only does it have this diversity, but it's actually the world's fourth most populous nation. And within that population, there's at least 10 million indigenous people, which continue to live mostly within the forested areas of Borneo, as well as, uh, you know, a handful of other islands. So you got like a population larger than New York City living on 15,000 islands and sort of paradise, even though there's volcanoes and stuff. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about people living traditional lifestyles within native ecologies at a size that is huge, really. Yeah, we're talking about as many indigenous people living traditionally as the entire population of, say, Sweden. It's not just a few tribes. Yeah. Um, why do you know so much about population counts off the top of your head? I like to keep tabs on everybody. Don't worry about it. That's, uh, that's definitely not more suspicious. What? You know, that. You were saying about the Dayak? What are we talking about? Oh. Don't worry about what I do, Andy. Okay. I, I, I try not to. So, yeah, there's a lot of people living in these forests and living traditional lives. Unfortunately, the world has discovered that, despite this, there's actually a lot of rare minerals and timber to be harvested. Oh, here we go. Fun times. Fun times always when America discovers things. So, well, actually, white people. I, I, America's off the hook, I think, on this one. So, in Indonesia from around the 1980s onward, deforestation is estimated to be around 4 million acres every year. Yes, that seems sustainable. Totally. So most of this started in around the 1970s. Since then, the National Forest Policy of Indonesia has set a threshold of around 880 or so million cubic feet of timber that could be harvested for it to be sustainable. So they're not close, are they? You were just saying that, and I know I'm going to be mad when you tell me, but I, I'm just go ahead and tell me. You sure? I don't want to break you. I, I asked for it. And when they say you asked for it, like I'm, I'm asking for it. All right. So by the 1990s, they consumed around 2.8 million cubic feet, which is well over double that threshold. Further, after the sites were clear cut and logging roads were put in, the solution was to plant plantation forests to replace those natural successions of species with the idea that it would actually aid in sustainable forestry by reducing cutting down native forests. So exotic, fast growing species were brought in with no natural competition which ultimately have massive health issues, drain the nutrients from the soil, especially if you're cutting them, taking them out, and obviously introduce a whole bunch of stuff that is not native to the region. And so we talked about the soil quality and how healthy it was at the beginning of this episode. And so I'm sure removing all of that nutrients and taking away the amount of time it takes for that nutrients to be replaced, I'm sure this didn't really end well, right? Yeah, exactly. So land degradation really takes hold pretty quick here. And this isn't the only like major issue that's endangering these native people. Mining is also a huge cause of major ecological destruction, particularly in Kalimantan, but it has also been the main source of income for the government in the region. So specifically, there's this company called PT Kalyan Equatorial Mining. It owns one of the largest gold mines in the world, which is in Kalimantan. What's interesting is the mine is 90% owned by the Rio Tinto Foundation of Australia. So there's your white people, and 10% owned by actual mining firms out of Indonesia. Yeah, I thought, I don't know what I thought, but you somehow made white people evil <laughs> again in this episode, and I think it's funny. <laughs> We're pretty much like Scooby-Doo and just assume an old white dude's behind it. Yeah, I just want to get to the part where we rip off fake faces and see the monsters who are underneath. I mean, we can rip them off, but I'm not sure if they're going to be fake. I mean, it's still the the thrill of just ripping a face. <laughs> you know, do some bath salts, live our best life. Yes. It's about that time. So things are going well there then, huh? 
Yeah, so not only do they have these mines that are stripping massive amounts of gold and silver, but they also process these minerals there which leads to massive cyanide leaching, which obviously causes significant environmental damage. Now, for each ton of ore that's extracted, there's about five tons of tailings, or the leftover byproducts of these processes, which are produced. And so that's just more, what, like industrial waste? What do they do with that? You know, they follow their uh, environmental protocols, which is dumping it in the river or wherever. Like, they don't give a shit. Yeah, so everything's fine in Indonesia then. Yeah, everything's fine. Uh, there's been problems, but it's going to be fine. Everyone knows America's going to come in. We're going to clean it up. We're going to set up a military base. And then we're going to drill deeper and find other shit to dig out of the ground. Six months, we open up a Coca-Cola plant. They'll be rolling in freedom. They'll love their freedom. They will have so much freedom. They won't know what to do with it. They'll be sick of freedom. They'll be trying to buy more freedom. <laughs> so... Yeah, there's there's a lot of problems, and these problems will really continue, at least in the short term. But fortunately, and I say this with like a massive asterisk, as climate change has been taking hold and the forest plantations have started to fail because of obvious reasons, if anyone you know consulted an ecologist, for example, countries like Indonesia are starting to turn more towards those traditional ecological knowledges. A term you might have heard is tech, which stands for this to find solutions to deal with ecological destruction. Now, what's left to be shown is whether or not this will be a typical lip service bullshit thing, or if this really leads to any meaningful change. So this part kind of brought this image to my head because I can totally see it happening. But like somebody with like a PowerPoint presentation, they got to go to this meeting on how to think green and jump on the new fad of sustainability and getting to sell people and they come up with this powerpoint and say tech is the new tech so t-e-k is the new (laughs) tech technology is the new tech yeah and i'm just picturing them like selling this to like you know the corporate board while they're like yeah we gotta we gotta get the message out there we're green now fucking white kids will love it (laughs) it just it just gives me a headache just like thinking about it because i know like abbreviations and acronyms are like very like that's ingrained in the corporate america and for some reason it gives people the idea that they know what they're talking about and they're well versed in a subject if they've abbreviated and made acronyms out of everything yeah i don't know just this whole concept it's just it's really funny to me but i can see how it was like incepted in like an office somewhere and they're like we got to sell this shit i worry heavily that it follows the path of like you know people are starting to wake up to this idea of decolonizing our food systems especially here in the united states where there's like the very pervasive complicated issue of colonialism now what we're seeing here in the u.s is if you look at like the circuits of folks that are talking about these subjects it's like still 80% white people saying, hey, we need to go listen to indigenous people or marginalized people and blah, blah, blah. And that's myself included. And how do we not do that? Which I feel like is what we're seeing here, or I'm worried that we're seeing here. Like you said, this boardroom said, hey, it's more profitable if we acknowledge these things and we're going to make a bunch of money by repackaging traditional things, kind of like organic foods. Like organic isn't special. It's just going back. To how things were right so why am i paying a premium to not do shitty things and then also again let it be owned predominantly by the people that forced us to go the other direction so they can make money on both ends so like i said we're talking about like incredible diversity within this region so we're, we're speaking in pretty broad strokes about all of this stuff but given the the size and the scope and the importance of this region globally even I thought it was really worth discussing the the history of these traditional peoples and where they stand today and putting it on people's radar. Yeah, I think size and scope are the two words that come to mind when I think about this episode and what surprised me. When typically we talk about indigenous people and sort of protecting the way that they live and things like that, my mind typically goes straight to like the Amazon and stuff like that. And this part of Asia I'm not going to say is like foreign to me. It's just I haven't really thought about that side of the world because island living is something completely different than what I'm used to. I know that living on an island is absolutely crazy. Resources are finite. Are You feel that you feel resources being finite a bit more because you can't just run away or go somewhere else when things go bad. You got to make it work. 
and the way that they've figured out a way to to live and thrive for 6,000 years that we've talked about in this episode is extremely fascinating to me. And it's also inspiring and lets me know that there is a way to do all of this and make all of the things that we talk about work. It's just sort of, you got to get in there and get your fire beaver on and start setting fires and see what works. We're the Bernie boys. I like that. <laughs> so, yeah, the, I think that's fair. Um, you know, when we think boys. about like, you know, you see stuff on the internet about like indigenous people protect 80% of the world's diversity. What does that really mean? I think people assume it means places like the Amazon or it's predominantly the Amazon. We hear a lot of talk about things like protecting Brazil from cattle grazing, which is a very valid concern. I'm not trying to dismiss that at all. But I don't know if I've really heard anyone talk about this. I think it's important then with our platform to spend some time talking about this kind of stuff if no one else is going to, or if at least it's not being talked about at scale that we talk about things like the Amazon when it's just as important. Yeah, we're talking about it. I have no idea if it's coherent, but we are talking about it. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Are we done talking about it? I, I, I think so. Are we? I mean, I do have other stuff to do today. I got to take these leaves. What am I going to do with all these leaves? Man, you're going to go make some uh, JMS, right? Yeah, I'm making some JMS. That's what I'm going to do. I got a, I got this gross bucket. I'm just going to put some water in there. My dogs have been drinking leaf water for so long now. It's so good for them. They love it. Yeah, it's great for they them. They literally like run outside and they love that bucket. I don't know what it is, but it's making me want to try it. I think you should. It's going to be great for you. Should, should I do it? 100%. I support this. I'm going to drink some leaf tea. Yeah. Mm. I'm a great influence. My name is Elliot. And I guess I'm Andy. And this is the Poor Pearls Almanac. Thanks for listening. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.